Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be telling us for Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit Night of the Living Dummy 3. I have no distinct memory of reading this book, but the cover is familiar enough that I probably checked it out from the library at least once. These Night of the Living Dummy books are also similar, I'm not surprised I couldn't remember it. If you've read the first two books, you've read 75% of this one. I would recommend reading it because it does have some fun moments, but don't go in looking for a major switch up in the dummy formula. This 1996 cover is one of my favorites. I'm always a fan of the busier covers, and this one has plenty to enjoy. We get a nice look at Slappy and some of the other dummies mentioned in this book, although notably not Rocky, who is probably the second most referenced one after Slappy. I just enjoy all the different details between the dummies and think it's a pretty solid cover, but not as creepy as the first. The 2005 slime border gives us a closer look at the dummies by zooming in just a bit. It also switches out the green and yellow cover for some blue and gold, which just isn't as interesting, and doesn't match the picture great. The 2015 version is a very solid cover. It has a fun angle on Slappy, and I like that we get to see some of the other dummies in the background. These dummies all look more menacing than in the original, and they've really nailed that unsettling jaw that ventriloquist dummies have. I think this is one of the better new covers. The merchandise this week is pretty limited, with a pair of puzzles at varying levels of difficulty, and a bookmark featuring Slappy in his armchair. This book came with a special trading card tearout that gives some key moments from the book and a quote from Arl Stein himself. There was also a tearout of a bookmark with 10 instructions from Curly. Our front tag says, Every dummy has its day, and his night, which is a play on the phrase, Every dog has its day. The back tag says, When dummies speak, everybody listens. So let's read this blurb on the back. Trina O'Dell's dad used to have a ventriloquist act. That's why he has all those dummies in the attic. He calls it his dummy museum. There's a dummy with freckles, and one with a sneer just like Rocky. Trina and her brother Dan think the dummies are pretty cool, but now there are voices in the attic, and the dummies keep showing up in the strangest places. No way those dummies could be alive, right? Okay, let's start this summary. The book opens with our introduction to Trina O'Dell and her brother Dan. They live in a giant creaky old house and are currently creeping up to explore the attic. We get some classic non-subtle Stein character descriptions and learn that Trina is a tall chubby redhead with green eyes while her brother gets the nickname Mouse because he's short, skinny, with dark hair and eyes and a pointy little chin. Their attic is extra spooky because it houses their father's old ventriloquist dummy collection because he's an ex-ventriloquist, and now he basically works at a radio shack. The family call their attic the Dummy Museum because the dad is taken to collecting and repairing ventriloquist dummies and storing them up there. If Slappy is able to bring all these dummies to life, we're going to have a proper sequel, kind of like how Alien got aliens. Some of these dummies are getting actual introductions, so they might be important later. So far we have Wilbur, who was the dad's original dummy and the star of his act. Wilbur has glasses and a checkered yellow and black suit, which you can see on the cover. We also have Rocky, who Trina thinks is the scariest looking dummy because he has a sneer instead of a smile, and a striped red and white t-shirt, which I'm not seeing on the cover. Dan used to torment Trina with Rocky, I'm gonna get you Trina, I'm coming to your room tonight Trina, and I'm gonna get you. I first read this as the dad doing this to Trina and was thinking, that's a little aggressive, but it makes much more sense as sibling behavior. We're introduced to another dummy, and this one is Miss Lucy, the only girl of the bunch and she has long curly blonde hair and bright blue eyes. Dan is making Miss Lucy harass Tina, when suddenly she looks across the room and sees Rocky blink, then shout, Trina, I'm gonna get you, in a chapter cliffhanger. It turns out, I gave the dad too much credit earlier, because he's in cahoots with Dan and this is just a prank bro, because he was the one controlling Rocky. Trina is low-key ruthless, and mentions that the reason her father had to give up being a ventriloquist was despite being talented at not moving his lips, was that his joke sucked and now he gets to work retail. Dad has a surprise for them though, because while dumpster diving for lotion, he found a mystery dummy in the trash and I bet you can guess where this is going. I leaned in close to check out Dad's new treasure. It had wavy brown hair painted on top of its head. The face was kind of strange, kind of intense. The eyes were bright blue. They shimmered, sort of like real eyes. The dummy had bright red painted lips curved into a smile. An ugly smile, I thought, kind of gross and nasty. His lower lip had a chip on one side so it didn't quite match the other lip. The dummy wore a gray double-breasted suit with a white shirt collar. The collar was stapled to his neck. He didn't have a shirt, instead his wooden chest been painted white. Big black leather shoes, very scuffed up, dangled from his gray skinny pants. The dad then describes how he glued Slappy's head back together, and I like that it's at least acknowledged that Slappy had his head split open in the last book, because the last sequel just had Slappy join a new family without any sort of continuity. Although there is no mention of a giant evil worm or a moldy sandwich inside Slappy's head. I also think Stein really wants children to know the dangers of pulling random shit out of the trash and bringing it home. The dad wants to call him Smiley, and the kids think this is a terrible name, and they're not wrong. Trina does a quick count of all the dummies in the room just to see how big the collection has gotten, and is uneasy when she realizes they've hit unlucky number 13. Dan then notices a mysterious piece of paper in the dummy's suit pocket, and if you've been following this trilogy, you again know where this is going. Trina grabs the paper and reads, Karu Marie Odana Lama Molanu Karanu. I want to know who keeps putting these magic words back with Slappy after disposing of his body. 
Trina looks at Slappy in confusion after reading the spell and thinks he may have just winked at her. Slappy then ups the ante and slaps Trina across the face, probably to further establish he will not be going by Smiley. Dan somehow missed all of this and thinks that Trina is just messing with him. The dad returns to the attic and when Trina tries to explain what just happened, he says a very dad phrase, you can't kid a kidder, and ignores Trina from there. The dad then announces he has good news, their uncle Cal and cousin Zane are coming to visit. This causes Dan to simulate vomiting because these kids are not fans of their nerdy wimpy cousin. Their dad then makes one demand, no scaring Zane. Apparently the last time he visited, Trina and Dan terrified him to the point he refused to re-enter the house. I kind of identify with Trina and Dan on this one. My sister and I definitely had cousins we tormented too. It's the circle of life. We jump to later and Trina is rocking out on the piano when Zane arrives. She has lingering guilt over how she treated him the last time and is a little nervous to see him. She has good reason too because her and Dan really went all out. We did everything we could to make him even more scared. We walked around in the attic every night, howling softly like ghosts, making the floor creak. We crept into his bedroom closet in the middle of the night and made him think his clothes were dancing. We rigged a pair of mom's pantyhose so they cast a ghostly shadow of legs on his bedroom floor. Poor Zane, I think Dan and I just went a little too far. After a few days, he jumped at every sound. His eyes kept darting from side to side like a frightened lizard's. Trina also mentions part of the reason it's so fun to scare Zane is because he doesn't look like he's the type to be scared because he's huge and athletic looking. When we finally meet Zane, we learn he has a new hobby and is very into photography. So into it that he proceeds to blind everyone with rapid photos because he only likes canted shots. The dad is supportive of this and lets him know he actually set up a dark room in the basement for Zane to use. Zane asks Dan if he's still into video games and he replies, Mostly sports games. I have the new NBA jams and I'm saving my allowance to get the new 32-bit system. You still play? New 32-bit system must have been Stein's way of avoiding actually name dropping a gaming system because a quick google taught me that this refers to the Sega Saturn, the Sony Playstation, and the Nintendo 64. Zane goes upstairs to unpack when we end the chapter with a sudden scream of horror from his room. The family races upstairs to find Zane trembling in fear because as he opened the bedroom door, Rocky, the ugly dummy from earlier, fell from above and plopped onto Zane. Dan is immediately suspect number one but claims innocence. Trina and Dan begrudgingly haul Rocky back up into the attic while arguing back and forth over who actually pulled the prank, when they're surprised to find Zane actually wants to come up too. He of course wants to take pictures of the dummies and seems to be trying to conquer his fear of them through exposure therapy. They mess with the dummies for a bit and take some pictures, but just before leaving the attic, the hits just keep on coming for Zane as he cries out in pain in another chapter cliffhanger. In a plot twist, this wasn't Slappy, it was a redheaded dummy named Arnie that slapped Zane. Zane accuses Dan of doing it somehow, despite Dan being across the room. Zane threatens to tell his uncle and the kids beg him not to and try to convince him that maybe the dummy just slipped forward somehow. Zane is very insistent that no, it reached up and slapped him, but he doesn't end up tattling on his two cousins. Trina is pissed at Dan and doesn't understand why he can't stop harassing Zane, and Dan is pissed at Trina for not believing him. Later that night, Trina is still steaming about this in bed when she suddenly hears a hoarse whisper close to her ear. Trina. Trina. She hops out of bed ready to throw down, but this just ends up being Zane. Once Trina calms down, she learns Zane heard strange voices in the attic. She listens carefully but concludes he had to be just dreaming. She agrees to have a little midnight snack with Zane, but once they reach the kitchen, they're surprised to find a strange figure sitting in the dark at the kitchen table. Trina flips on the light and starts screaming. They spot Rocky sitting at the kitchen table with his little wooden head propped up on his hands. Trina grabs Zane and is like, enough of this shit, let's go beat up Dan and teach him a lesson. They reach his room and are surprised to find he's actually sleeping. They turn to leave when they hear shuffling in the hallway and are greeted by Rocky. Except not really, Rocky is currently being held by the neck by the dad who wants to know what the fuck is going on. Trina doesn't really have any answers for this, but suspects Dan is still somehow involved. They all head for bed only for Trina to head down the next morning and find Rocky at the table once again. She raises him back into the attic to avoid her father's wrath, but spends the rest of breakfast extra unsettled. They spend the afternoon being extra nice to Zane, and literally spend hours and hours taking pictures of walls, banisters, and moldings around the house. What Zane wants, Zane gets today. This actually takes 4 pages to get through, so Stein is really trying to hammer just how boring this is, and guess what, he was successful. We eventually make it to the dark room, and upon developing the photos we make a shocking discovery. Every photo is of Rocky. We then jump to Trina in the attic, and she's busy interrogating a room full of dummies because she's lost control of her life. She wants to know who they're working with, and still suspects Dan. As she's leaving the attic, she hears soft giggling, followed by some insult comedy. Is your hair red, or are you starting to rust? Excuse me, I cried, raising my hand to my mouth. My eyes swept quickly from dummy to dummy. Who said that? Hey Trina, you're pretty. Pretty ugly. That was followed by another soft snicker. Evil laughter. I like your perfume. What is it? Flea and tick spray? My eyes stopped on the new dummy, the one dad called Smiley. He sat straight up in the corner on the couch. The voice seemed to be coming from him. Pinch me. I'm having a nightmare. Or is that really your face? Trina realizes the new dummy Smiley is the culprit, and just as she's trying to process the fact that he's talking, the dummy suddenly starts moving in a chapter cliffhanger. Dan then pops up from behind the couch and asks who's making the dummy say all those things. 
Trina, of course, doesn't buy Dan's act of confusion and wants to know why he's even in the attic to begin with if he's so innocent. Dan then blows Trina's mind by saying he thinks Zane is behind all this and trying to get them in trouble for scaring him the last time they were there. This level of deception never occurred to Trina, and once Dan lays out his case, she's somewhat convinced. She agrees to meet Dan that night up in the attic so they can catch Zane in the act. We waste no time in jumping immediately to that night in the attic. The kids are creeping around in the dark and settle on hiding behind the couch as they wait for Zane to appear. This scene would have creeped me out a bit as a kid because Stein does a nice job of showing just how unnerving it would be to be surrounded by all these dummies in the dark. It's a little before midnight and eventually Trina drifts off to sleep, only to awaken sometime later to the sound of shuffling in the darkness, and her instincts tell her one of the dummies are alive and moving around. Dan is already awake and peering behind the couch. All Trina can see is shadows, but she sees the outline of a figure messing with one of the dummies. Trina sneaks over to the light, and when she flips it on, both her and Dan start shrieking in a chapter cliffhanger. Except these are shrieks of righteousness, because it actually is Zane. He confesses yes, it was him, and he was out for revenge. Zane is pretty pleased with himself and can't stop grinning, and the three kids agree to call it a truce. This is pretty similar to the first slappy book when we find out Lindy was the one causing the chaos midway through the book, not a dummy. I would have preferred this to be all the work of Slappy. The next day the cousins are having a grand old time together, riding bikes and enjoying the nice spring weather, especially now that they are not expecting each other of evil. They stop by an old well in the backyard so Zane can take some pictures. This scene is oddly specific, so I suspect we'll return to this well in the future. I forever associate wells with Samara, so maybe this is just me projecting on the story. They head back inside when they enter Zane's room, they're all horrified to find that it's been trashed. In the middle of the mess they spot Rocky, and their mob appears suddenly behind them and assumes they've been robbed. The cousins aren't even sure who to suspect because they've all been together, so they clean the room in silence. The dad is livid and wants to know if he needs to bolt the attic shut to stop them from being such little monsters, and they probably should have taken him up on that offer to be honest. We hop to that night and we're treated to Trina's unsettling nightmare. That night, I dreamed once again about ventriloquist dummies. I saw them dancing, a dozen of them, all dad's dummies from upstairs. I saw them dancing in Zane's room, dancing over the tangled piles of clothes and books, dancing over the bed, over the toppled bed table. I saw Rocky dancing with Miss Lucy. I saw Wilbur doing a frantic crazy dance on top of the dresser. And I saw Smiley, the new dummy, clapping his wooden hands, bobbing his head and grinning, grinning from the middle of the room as the other dummies danced around him. They moved their big heads over their hands, their skinny legs twisted and bent. They danced in silence. No music, no sound at all. And all their bodies twisted and swayed, their faces remained frozen. They grinned at one another with blank unblinking eyes, grinned their frightening red-lipped grins. She wakes up and is suddenly face to face with Rocky who's reaching for her throat. Trina goes straight into fight mode and launches Rocky off her and is getting ready to finish him off when the parents burst into the room to see what all the noise is about. The dad is so angry he pulls out his hair and has no way to do with his children anymore. He storms up to the attic with Rocky and leaves Trina to go back to sleep. I don't know if Trina is even going to attempt to go back to sleep. I'd be awake after attempted murder via dummy. As she's drifting off to sleep she hears somebody at her door and at first she thinks it's Rocky back to finish her off but it's just Dan. He thinks Zane is still up to no good because now that there's a truce, he can really get them in revenge. He also points out that Zane had to go back to get his camera just before they left so he had an opportunity to trash the room. They plan once again to hide in the attic the next night to catch Zane in the act, but first were treated to a dinner party the next day. It's all going fine at first, but when Zane goes up to his bedroom to get his camera he just starts screaming. They all race into the room and find him holding a smashed camera and see Rocky sitting in a pile of film. Zane races out of the room crying. And just as dad is getting ready to release hell on his two children, they hear a loud crash from downstairs. Everybody races back down the stairs into the dining room, where we see the mom sobbing because her fancy dinner has been trashed, and seated at the table as if they're celebrating or smiling Wilbur. The next chapter opens with Trina and Dan hiding in the attic around midnight, discussing just how twisted Zane has to be to wreck his own camera and trash the dinner. Trina is prepared to catch Zane in the act this time, and has brought a camera of her own because, with this level of destruction, she wants proof to clear her and Dan from trouble. After an hour of waiting in the dark, they hear shuffling in the room. Trina pops up and takes some pictures, but is terrified when the flash reveals Smiley shuffling towards the stairs with Rocky over his shoulder. Trina flips on the lights and screams for Smiley to stop, where he corrects her and says, It's not Smiley, it's Slappy. She tackles Slappy to the ground, but she promptly is smacked in the forehead and kicked in the ribs because Slappy is firmly established. He has no problem beating the shit out of children in this series. Dan gets a hold of Slappy, and then he falls into his usual slave this and slave that. Slappy then proceeds to thrash Dan good until Trina gets a solid enough grip to yank him off of Dan. The dad suddenly appears due to all of the noise and Slappy immediately goes limp. He's disgusted with his two kids and doesn't even know what to say to them. Trina remembers her camera but is disappointed to find that the back is sprung open the film has been ruined. The dad is like I don't even know what to do with you two little heathens and tells him to put the dummies away and heads back downstairs. The moment the dad is gone, Slappy springs back to life and gets extra creepy. The dummy winked at me. His ugly grin grew wider, and then he puckered his red lips and made disgusting wet kissing sounds. Don't touch me, slave, Slappy growled. We then move into more of the usual slave talk where Slappy informs the kids that they'll be his slaves and do whatever he says or he'll get them in even more trouble. 
You'd think by book three, Slappy would change his approach a bit, but that's all he's got, I guess. Trina will not submit willingly and remembers his head had been cracked in two when the dad pulled him out of the trash and concludes she needs to bash Slappy's head in somehow. She settles on just pulling it apart with her hands manually, but shocker, this doesn't work. Thanks for the head massage, slave. Now rub my back. Trina's wheels are spinning, which she has another great idea. Dan and Trina proceed to tackle Slappy once again. This time, Slappy gets a hold of Trina's ear for a bit, but they manage to subdue him and stuff a handkerchief in his mouth. They haul Slappy outside and head into the backyard, and the entire time Dan is like, what are we doing? But it's pretty obvious they're taking Slappy to the well, and they are. They chuck him down the well, celebrate, and then they head back inside feeling successful. If this is anything like the previous two books, which it is, because once Stein has a formula, he does not deviate, Slappy should be waiting for them the next morning some Frosted Flakes. And guess what? The next morning Slappy's at the breakfast table without Frosted Flakes, so I guess we're switching it up this time. As much fun Slappy the character is, would it kill Stein to try something even slightly different? I've enjoyed this one a little better than the second book up to this point, because at least Slappy did more than just paint shit, but this is lazy as hell. Trina reluctantly scoops Slappy up and carries him towards the attic, where he of course has to whisper, Nice try, slaves. But give up. I'm never going away. Never. Just crack his head open and be done with it. We jump to later that afternoon, and Dan and Trina are alone in the house because everybody else conveniently went shopping. They're brainstorming what to do when Trina suddenly has an idea and wants to return to the attic. These kids didn't even bother with locking Slappy up somewhere. At least Amy had the good sense to trap Slappy in a closet when she plotted. They creep back up into the attic where they find Slappy sleeping on the floor right where they left him. I guess Slappy was tired after crawling out of that well. Trina reveals her plan is to read the magic words from the jacket pocket and see if they force him back to sleep. Or, you know, wake up all the other dummies in the room. She sneaks up to Slappy, and just as she's about to get the paper, he springs to life and shouts, Gotcha! Which, who saw that coming? Slappy spends a chapter latched onto Trina's arm as she flails him around and he makes comments on slavery. Danny eventually decides to help out and is able to get the magic words from Slappy because he's too busy breaking Tina's wrist. Dan reads the magic words and the kids wait in silence to see if it worked, which it didn't. Trina is defeated because that was her only plan, since I guess she forgot about her better plan from earlier, cracking his fucking head open. Trina and Dan are back into the corner when Trina sees movement. She looks up and sees 12 of the other dummies slowly moving off their chairs and starting shuffling towards Dan and her like a bunch of zombies. Wilbur limped towards us, his big chipped hand stretched out, ready to grab us. Lucy's big blue eyes gleamed coldly as she staggered towards us. Arnie let out a high-pitched giggle as he pulled himself closer. Closer. Dan and I spun around. We had nowhere to turn, nowhere to escape. The dummy's big shoes scraped heavily over the wooden floors. Their knees bent with each step. They looked as if they would tumble to the floor, but they kept coming, lurching forward, bodies bending, heads bobbing. Alive. Wooden creatures, alive. To Trina's surprise, the dummies shuffle past her and move on to Slappy. They proceed to surround him, and all Trina can see is a pile of dummies and hear Slappy's terrified screams. While all this is happening, she hears footsteps coming up the attic stairs. Zane turns the corner, and all the dummies collapse to the ground lifeless. Trina gets a good look at Slappy, and although his head isn't cracked open, he appears to be dead. Zane declares he's caught them mid-prank and he's going to tell everybody. We jump to the next day, and Trina and Dan are grounded for life. They're saying goodbye to their cousin Zane and Uncle Cal, and are hopeful they may never see them again after all this. Their dad wants to get Zane a new camera to make up for the smashed one, but Zane says he's no longer into photography and would like to try out being a ventriloquist instead. The dad is delighted to hear this and sends Trina up to fetch a dummy for Zane. She happily selects Slappy and hopes they're both very happy together. She really resents Zane for getting them in trouble at the very end here, but really he's just been a victim like Trina and Dan, so I'm really not getting where all this hatred Trina suddenly has for Zane is coming from. But anyways, as Zane walks to the car with Slappy in hand, Trina sees Slappy give one final wink. And that's how this one ends, with Zane being punished after spending the entire book being terrorized by Slappy. Night of the Living Dummy 3 got its own episode, and it's a two-parter, and I think it's better than the book. Our notable actor this week is Hayden Christensen, who played Zane, because he's one of the bigger stars we've seen so far, going on to play Anakin Skywalker in episodes 2 and 3, and most recently, in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, so let's start the episode. I'm always here for an episode introduction by Stein. Hello, I'm R.L. Stein. I write the Goosebumps books. What is today's story? It's Night of the Living Dummy 3. Was that okay? You were a little stiff. This would have scared me, but she is unimpressed. Hello, Trina. You shouldn't be here. Stiff. <laughs> There's our star. Where'd you find- Slappy's getting some work done. You weren't even gonna tell us he was coming. It was supposed to be a- Your best behavior, right? And no practical jokes. The last time Zane visited, they put him in a field. Never read this stuff out loud. Karoo Marie O'Donna Loma Malonu. Slappy says, let me rest in peace. 
Some goosebumps magic. Slappy only eats frosted flakes. <gasps> the dad has jokes in this one. Oh, honey, I think I've done myself an injury. I cut my <laughs> thumb off. Zane remains fearless. Here, get this one. I hate dummies. Nonsense. Bart, want to see my new chainsaw and hockey mask? Help me, no, no! Help me, help me! No. Zane does not fuck around. Help! 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 help. <laughs> Slappy is like Santa, he's always watching. <laughs> I've always wanted to do this. I look kind of pale. I like that this family decorates the house with dummies. <laughs> Great work, Zane. You nailed it. You keep your lips a little bit apart, okay? And you have to learn how to control all the muscles in your mouth. It'd be great if it really was just the dad and he secretly can't stand Zane either. Ow! He kicked me! Who, who kicked it? The, the, the dummy, the dummy! Slappy is into modern art. Good. What happened here? Oh no! Ah! My roast! I'm kind of surprised they kept this storyline in. And they thought I was afraid of you? <laughs> I did not expect to see Slappy hustle like that. Except, I do hate the one. Evil green magic. <laughs> Casually hiding bodies in the background. If anyone ever needed a night out, it's you and me. I'm expecting more out of Slappy than this. Zane! This is more like it. Wow. It's oh, a pretty good thumbnail potential. Come on, Slappy old buddy old pal. I'm enjoying the kick Slappy's getting in this time. Ow! You didn't say. Slappy's a lot more active than in the last episode. Abra, cadabra. Oh, I love that trick. These kids aren't playing around this time. Hey, what are you doing? The answer is obviously fire, not a well. Do you see how I draw it? Oh, 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 oh. I'm three. <laughs> Quiet. Conquering Your Fears, a very timely book. Slappy returns with the jokes. <laughs> Frog in my throat! Slappy has Spider Man powers. So, you gotta be this isn't a scene I saw coming. Open up the door! The door! Okay? Slappy has an entourage. These are my friends. <laughs> Turning Zane into a dummy is way more interesting than the book ever was. And I'm Zane, don't look so wooden. Mm, 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 mm. Get it? If you try to tell anyone, I'll turn both of you into dummies. I had the same question. I think they're sleeping. Dummy sleep? Jump scare. Don't take some action, guys. Throat punch. <laughs> Reading the words seemed a little bit more effective, unless this is a fake out. <laughs> oh, oh, good. It was. <laughs> oh, there it is. I was wondering where we were going to get the slavery talk. You are my slaves. Just like Rockhead over there. Mm. Aw, Rocky loves the family more. No contest. Oh, you do it! Never go against oh. the family! I killed Mufasa. <laughs> the episode is so much better than the book. I thought they'd have him stay a dummy as a twist. Man, I just had the weirdest dream. We're getting artsy with this. Look at Zane getting a talent. I kind of love Dummy Stein. 
The ending did have a good twist. Overall, I thought Night of the Living Dummy 3 started out stronger than the second Living Dummy book, but quickly fell into the same predictable story around the midpoint. I enjoyed the chaos Slappy caused and his unhinged dialogue as usual, but I was disappointed to see that this book hit most of the same beats as our previous ones. I enjoyed when the other 12 dummies sprang to life, but that was only a couple paragraphs before it quickly ended. If you're going to have 12 other dummies come to life, actually use them. I guess I just wanted more from the third book in a series. I'm going to give this one 3 out of 5 Rockies. It just didn't do anything new enough to warrant another book, despite having a great opportunity to do so. Okay, on to our totals. Not that the living dummy didn't have any vomit, shoulder scares, asshole victims, or it was only a dreams, but it did have a 90s moment. In Getting Jake with the 90s, we had one 90s moment. This was our mention of 32-bit gaming systems, a phrase I wasn't super familiar with and was also oddly specific. This raises our total to 134 G 90s moments. In It's a Prank Bro, I counted five pranks, and they were mostly the work of Zane framing his cousins. These included the dad pretending to be Rocky at the start of the book, Rocky dropping from the ceiling, Rocky in the kitchen, Rocky in the kitchen again, and a camera roll full of pictures of Rocky. Rocky, Rocky, Rocky. This brings our series total to 103 prank bros. Night of the Living Dummy had quite a few chapter cliffhangers with a total of 15, and they were pretty solid in general. This raises our Goosebumps total to 493. Once again, I don't really have anything I consider a clunky cliffhanger, because those usually get a solid eye roll out of me. Shocker ending. Our big twist for this book was when Zane is carrying Slappy out to the car, blissfully unaware that his cousins just cursed him, and Slappy gives one last wink to Trina. This brings our Goosebumps series total to 33. Well, that's it for Night of the Living Dummy 3. It's not like I outright dislike this one, and in many ways it's very on par with the first two, which is kind of why I was disappointed. If you're going to make a trilogy, you have to spice it up a bit or it's just going to be a letdown. Next week is Bad Hair Day, which I kind of remember, mostly that there's just a truly awful younger sibling in it. Let me know in the comments what you thought of Night of the Living Dummy 3. How do you rank the three books? Can you tell I'm losing my voice at the end of this one? Would you own a ventriloquist dummy? Also, what did you think of my evil toy horror clips this week? Anyways, as always, thanks again for watching and make sure you subscribe for The Brad The Love